Alright, quiet please. May I have your attention a moment? Then we're done. The Vinyo Shra Agasakarta, the Spawalyam An Alta Akhorod, Corona Anok, Egg on Taspontis Shah, that Laura Vecchi for. Tashet Liakhe Brain, it's 50 years, just over 50 years since we first had an exhibition of Rona's. And it's a wonderful pleasure to have her back here again. Uh, it's kind of very retrospective, this show, a lot of very new work but also work going back to the 60s and the decades in between as well. Uh, and to open the exhibition, I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce you to a man whom I've known for even longer than I've known <laughs> <laughs> uh, All I tell you is we were in college together, so there were a few escapades here and there, and happy, happily a number of adventures since as well. Uh, one of the most wonderfully intellectual and erudite men I've ever met in my life. Would you welcome, please, Harold O'Toole. Well done. Thank you very much. Laura, and Margareta, and, and, and friends. <clears throat> um, I, I suppose it's a commonplace in any commentary on Galway these days uh, to describe it as a very cosmopolitan city. Um, and not only in promotional literature. People looking at the census data immediately refer to its size and the fact that for its size it has the most diverse, ethnically diverse population of any city or any settlement in Ireland. Um, certainly there are those who would say that that multi-ethnic, if you like, character of the city needs more, more regular cultural expression and cultivation. But nonetheless, nobody could deny the fact that in recent decades, Galway is an expanding, outward-looking, prosperous city with all the, the difficulties as well as the perks of being a special place. I even heard on the radio this morning someone describing it as the, the eating capital of the world. <laughs> there was such, such, such wonderful thing. Um, I suppose in, in thinking of that, it was probably not those kind of adjectives that would have been attached to Galway in 1967 when a young Italian artist arrived in the city uh, as a lettore in Italian in what was then rather splendidly described as the Department of Romance Languages. <laughs> uh, in what was even more splendidly described as UCG even at that time. And uh, it's not that Galway was, was, was not bright in its way in 1967. In fact, it was recovering after the difficult 1950s. But non nonetheless, the population of Galway was about 26,000. It's now over 80. It had an arts life and so on. But I think the streetscape, certainly among many of the buildings that had seen better days in the old commercial life of the city, it had a somewhat dilapidated look. Um, I wonder what the young Laura Vecchi thought when she arrived, but she might have taken some comfort from the fact that Italians had been here before her. She would have encountered the street of the Lombardy without traveling too far from the center of the town. But for whatever reason, she decided to stay. Uh, she stayed, stayed on as a lecturer in the Department of Italian, um, language and literature and art history in the fullness of time and indeed she married had a family and I think it's fair to say that in the 50 years or so we can say it, Tom Kenny has already said it I'm not giving any secrets in the 50 years ago since as a, since as it were <clears throat> she has been a, a luminous presence really in artistic creativity and an adornment to the cultural life of this city and indeed of the country. Mm. Now, of course, Laura had already exhibited her early work in Italy in the year of her arrival in Galway, having trained at the Brera Academy of Fine Art in Milano, an important nursery of technically accomplished and creatively original artists. And from these early years, critics identify the sharp, surrealist edge, as it were, her paintings in that, in that early phase. Her decision to settle in Galway, of course, did not require Laura, or indeed dispose her for that matter, to sever her connections 
or to abandon the influences, not only in creative arts, but more broadly cultural, of her native Italy. She has been back and forth throughout her life, not just simply to Italy, but to <coughs> continental Europe in many, er, many um, centres of art, for exhibitions, and with working studios abroad as well as at home here in Galway. And it wasn't always easy. A lifetime of teaching, with all that goes with that, and university administration such as it was, even if the touch was lighter then than it has become since. Uh, on top of that, family. And on top of that, again, the difficulty of getting good studio space. She had very often to fight for the, the, the infrastructure within which she could practice her art. Her list of exhibitions, solo or with select other artists, spanning these five decades is, of course, far too long for me to recite here in detail. The exhibitions of those early decades and galleries in Britain, Budapest, numerous galleries in Italy, and at most of the major galleries, including indeed the most ambitious and discerning galleries throughout Ireland. In the last 15 years, she has had continuing exhibitions, several in Milan, two in association with the International Conference on Michele Spina, the Sicilian art theorist and critic, and he has been the focus indeed of some of Laura's own academic work also as a critic. She has had collective exhibitions in Bologna, San Remo, Padova, in Puglia, in the region of Puglia, and an exhibition, a rather special one I gather, with three of her former, or two others of her former uh, colleagues in Brera, in the church of San Fidele di Tel, Vintelvi, in the province of Como. Uh, and that is very recently, that is perhaps the most recent one in 2017. It is, it is. Now I think it's, it's worth noting that Laura Vecchi's contribution to the visual arts in Galway and beyond was not confined to her own painting and graphic art, considerable as that was. She mentored and collaborated with other artists, including important work she did with Graphica too, in the years from 1976 to the later 1980s, with particular attention to technical excellence, etchings and engravings and techniques. She mentored the Galway art groups, and indeed she gave great assistance to other artists in placing their work, placing their artwork. A car accident followed by the untimely death of her husband, Frank Ford, in 1987, <coughs> led to an interval of silence, as it were, but resumed happily in the early 1990s when Laura returned to her work and showed clear signs of new directions, uh, effectively becoming, I suppose, formally more interdisciplinary. She had always been interdisciplinary in her interests, but the formal art began to reflect that dis interdisciplinarity perhaps a bit more. Her testament to artistic creativity resides above all else, and triumphantly indeed in her paintings, of which we're celebrating, as Tom said, a retrospective of sorts here in the Kelly, Ga Kelly Gallery this evening. We have to say of sorts with that qualification because it's one that reflects the career of an artist still in full creative flow. Almost half of the works on display here this evening have been completed, certainly since the turn of the millennium. No doubt critics, by which I mean professional art critics, and the sharp-eyed among you here, will find fascination in identifying and tracing a path of evolution, as it were, of maturation and continuing innovation in Laura's work throughout her career, from the early hard-edged surrealism to her more recent work. And it would be a good critic who would try and identify what the the characteristics of her late style are, as it were. My own response, which is not that of a critic, but my own response to this extraordinary body of work is not to categorize it in terms of genre or type, or indeed to calibrate its development, either in technical or other terms. As I say, this would be beyond my competence. I would simply wish to salute its sheer virtuosity and visual exuberance. Virtuosity in the first instance arises from its being rooted <coughs> in a mastery of technique. From the outset, I suspect Laura Vecchi was blessed with a firm hand, <laughs> which through her formal training and her dedication as an artist in etchings, engravings, and close work, she soon perfected it as a formidable and fine instrument of her painting 
and that's evident in all of the work around us this evening. But her virtuosity also announces itself in the confidence, the assurance of her bold visual statements, also visible around the walls here. Personally, for me, it is the palette of color and its deployment that is especially exciting. And even in those paintings which have, as it were, a presiding color, for example, blues, whether it is sky, sea, shore, the range and shading of color tone, the nuances in each individual painting, they're quite striking. Now, in acknowledging the range of subjects that mark this major exhibition, we might remark briefly on, I suppose, what others have seen as signature features of Laura Vecchi's style and of her paintings. These signature features are, are, of course, stylistic as well as thematic. For example, in content, I'm sure many of you have noticed already around the way in which birds, fishes, seascape, water sites, the natural light and life of seashore, shells, horizons, birds, birds' nests, and journeys. Journeys and the sense of curiosity of looking in and looking out and looking beyond. These evocations of the elemental in nature and the environment have been hailed by critics as representing a uniquely intense and authentic set of responses by an artist to the natural world. Observing the quotidian, the everyday, but in Lauda's case, it is not the ordinary of the everyday, but the extraordinary in the everyday. She herself has described it, and I don't want to embarrass her by citing her own words, but she has described it, she says, the, words relates, the work relates to subject matters observed in real life, but transformed by surreal or emphatic manner. Now, as far as stylistic matters are concerned, and here I will be impertinent because I will remark on what I've seen rather than what I, I, I know of. As far as stylistic matters are concerned, I'll only remark on the, the firm arc, not quite diagonal, but what I suppose I would call the southwesterly arc that is such a feature one finds in many of her paintings. An arc that's not to divide or segment the painting, but to guide the eye in the full apprehension and appreciation of the visual arrangement <coughs> that is contained. Before concluding, may I make brief mention of two further aspects of Laura Vecchi Ford's work as it surrounds us here in the Kenny Gallery this evening. Firstly, the portraits, which generally do not belong to the early part of her career, but to, um, to the maturing part of her career. They are powerful, and in their different ways, subtly responsive to character and circumstance. Mickey Finn, the ever-defiant Margareta Darcy, Umberto Eco, the mountains of knowledge, with a number of things that are characteristic, the restless mind longing for sleep in the reclining figure, and in the background, of course, the visual conceit of the mountain itself and the spectacle. Sean McSweeney. There's a, a playfulness in some of the visual conceits that nonetheless uh, does not detract at all from the profundity. And I might add the Joyce mask. There are probably other things that one could mention. The second and final aspect of the work on which I feel I should comment is the introduction increasingly of script or writing <coughs> into the texture of paintings in Laura's recent work. Now, as I understand it, these writings again have their origin in Laura Vecchi's intense responses to immediate experiences, to mood, to image, to object, and intensified by, by contemplation, as it were. Except in this case, the words move into forming poetic sequences, largely untitled, which then may stand alone or be incorporated or textured into the painting. Now, these poems or poetic sequences, poetic responses, are in book form. They are extremely rich. They are, insofar as I have been able to follow them, they are suggestive and elusive. 
and for those of us without direct access to the rhythms, musicality, and wordplay of the original Italian, they are frequently elusive also. <laughs> Finally, friends, I should say that we are here this evening obviously celebrating a long career and an exceptional body <coughs> of artistic work. But more than that, we are celebrating a life, a life of creativity and color, and happily, a life that is still in splendid glow. We salute you, Laura, and may you continue to enjoy good health and creative energy, as the old Romans put it, ad multos annos. <laughs> As Garoyd, <laughs> as Garoyd said, uh, Laura's poems are in book form, which we have incidentally outside. But we're very privileged now that our good friend Margareta Darcy is going to read one or two of these poems. They are incidentally in English and in Italian uh, in the book. The Italian won't be late. No. Yeah. So away yeah. uh, I'm going to read the um, introduction by the uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long by Daniel O'Donnell because it's the strangest opening that really anyone could imagine. So he says these are not translations. I am not a fan of poetry and song translation in general. And Laura's poetry, because of its unusual vocabulary, many words that I'm fairly sure not one Italian in a million would understand. <laughs> <laughs> in order to make very clear these difficulties, I have in the first few instances including, included a machine translation. So this is quite fascinating, the whole thing. Mm. These are not translations, nor have I made a selection. I simply used what I chanced to lay a hand on in various locations and in order of finding or of what fitted on the page. Most of them I do not understand. I have simply tried to make sense of them for myself and may often be in error. They are what I have previously called remakings. Wherever I had no idea what Laura wanted to say, I opted for the continuity of vague plausibility. You might call it jazz. And in the end, he says very, uh, very uh, um, thing. I work on the strictly take it or leave it basis. Take whatever comes. I do not subsequently tinker with them. Therein surely lies a path to madness. <laughs> so it is well worth it buying uh, these books and understanding them. But also, just for the introduction of this quite extraordinary, um, that we might say, what would we say he was? Um, a contrarian <laughs> of Daniel O'Donoghue. So I'm just going to read two. I'm going to read the machine translation and the English translation. I haven't got Italian, and Lara won't read them in the Italian. So, and so you'll have to. Uh, if there are any Italian speakers here, are they? <coughs> yes, they're all very shy. Joseph. Kira. 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 Well, apparently Kira won't read them either. <laughs> so. If we buy the book, it is that we can do our own reading Italian badly at home. <laughs> <laughs> but as uh, Daniel said, is that the poems are in conjunction with the pictures. And one of the pictures, which is the one in Italian, which is about the moon, is just around the corner there. And then the other one, which is also of the mirror, which is here. So I'm just going to read the machine translation of that one, and then Daniel's jazz one of that one. 
And of course, it's all from Lara. I want the moon in the well that better rereads and gets stuck fragments in small private waves, in lights and events, recently animated breath, in contribution of the diverged being and mirrored, but casual and essential, little being, big part, the universe. So all have a look at that one and remember the words. And now we will have this one. I want the moon in the well to glow, to soar. It's like to break up into small private waves and near breathless happenings in tribute to its mirrored otherness, random and essential, its smallness, a large portion of the Universe. Well done. Well done. Thank you. So, so far, the book is quite, quite extraordinary. I don't think there's any book of poetry is as extraordinary as this one. <laughs> There's a plug. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Garroyd first and foremost for her most remarkable presentation on this exhibition. And I want to thank you for being here and continue to enjoy the exhibition. We haven't run out of wine yet, so we didn't be in any hurry and enjoy paintings. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. All right. Oh, I'll leave the chair over here if you want to say something. Well done, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, 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 it sure is. I agree.